whatever situation you're in, whatever your best swing is, whether that's hard angle or middle back, just choose whatever ones you whatever whatever one you're going to execute best in the moment and do that because it's a high enough level swing that they're going to have a very difficult time digging it regardless of what the other team's doing. Mhm. Huh. And we, we won the match <laughs> with, with only her swinging middle back or hard angle. The set was a little inside, she hit hard angle. The set was in front of her, she hit middle back. And we had she had the clearance over the block. The block wasn't um, as big as she was, so she was able to swing middle back even if uh, the blocker stayed. And if the blocker pulled, well, she wasn't really hitting at her. <laughs> she, was, she was hitting the middle back or hard angle. And like I said, it was a high enough level swing, and she's putting enough pace on it to a good location that we ended up pulling out the match. Mark Burick here at Bitter at Beach. We have camps, clinics for players, camps and clinics for coaches. We have online programs where you can learn beach volleyball as a player, as a beginner, as a coach. If you ever want to take a course with us, you are more than welcome. And uh, we have a slew of opportunities for you to learn how to dive deeper into the game. And today we have a very special guest, uh, a friend from early in my volleyball career where we crossed paths and ran. And it's so cool to see her succeeding and making her rounds around the country uh, between indoor and beach volleyball. She is currently the assistant coach at Grand Canyon University in her hometown. And I love to welcome on to the show, Abra. <laughs> What's up? How are you? Fantastic. Excited to be here. Thanks for asking me to be on the show. Yeah, of course. Of course. It's nice to, um, I, I told you off camera, you actually coached indoor at mm -hmm. the college version of my high school. So St. Francis Prep mm -hmm. in Queens, New York, it graduates to St. Francis, Pre uh, St. Francis College in Brooklyn, and that's where you got your a few years coaching indoor there with a number of successful runs. So what brought you from living in Phoenix and then heading on over to New York where you, you were coaching? And then I'd, I'd like to really dive into all of the different places and clubs that you've coached um, throughout, right. kind of like a journey woman of, of volleyball coaching. <laughs> well, uh, how long you got? Because I've been a lot of places. Um, <laughs> I uh, I was in San Diego for a few years, was playing uh, kind of on the national tour for beach volleyball. Um, I met my now husband over there and he while he was training for the 2020, no, nope, 2012, that's how old I am, 2012 Olympics as a rower. After the 2012 Olympics, uh, he really wanted to make another run. I was doing fine at beach volleyball. You know, I liked it, but uh, I was at a good like kind of pause point in my career. So we decided to move with him over to Princeton, New Jersey, where the men's national team for U.S. rowing was relocated to. And I went with him and just started coaching over there and then was lucky enough to get my break at uh, St. Francis College. Wait, wait, wait. I what do you mean just started coaching? Like you just walked over there and be like, I know how to play volleyball. I'm going to coach at Princeton. Well, uh, like I said, how long you got for the podcast? <laughs> Started, originally started in NorCal when I was in college. Uh, spent two years at NorCal Juniors coaching there. Was in Air, Went back to Arizona for my master's and coached at Arizona Sky Juniors. And this is all indoor. Coached there for a few years while I was getting my master's to become a teacher. Was a teacher and coached at a local high school in Arizona. Then decided I wanted to play beach volleyball. So then went over to San Diego. <laughs> coached at San Diego City College. Coached at Wave Volleyball Club. Coached a little bit of beach for uh, Beach Dig, Cindy Phillips. Uh, I'm not sure if she's still running that, but she's awesome. And then met my husband. And then again, fast forward uh, to New Jersey. I was at Princeton for as an assistant. I was at Ryder as an assistant for a few months. And then got the job at St. Francis College. Um, all while my husband was training for the 2016 uh, Olympic Games. Cool. Uh, were these positions that you applied to? How did you apply? Did you know they were open? Did you just knock on a door and be like, hey, I know volleyball. I'm going to be living here for a little while. Let me check it out. Or was there an invite or a connection situation? I would say most of them are, I mean, you and you know the volleyball community. It's a, it's very connected. It's it's large, but it's small. Yeah. So yeah, I would say each job I got because I knew someone. My very yeah. first coaching job at NorCal, 
it's because the coach of my college team coached at that club. So she recommended me, you know, wave volleyball club, uh, Kevin McCullough, I knew from college Great and dude. yeah, cool dude. And he gave me a recommendation to Ed Machado, who was the director at the time. Okay. And Ed, like, that was actually one of my scarier interviews. He's like, Oh, welcome to the interview. Do you have your tennis shoes on? You're going to be playing volleyball. I'm like, what? <laughs> huh? Yeah, exactly. He had to test my skills. I went out there and had to like pass and set and hit and serve. And he's like, okay, you seem like a good enough volleyball player. Huh. <laughs> it, was, it was terrifying. Do you think, uh-huh. I mean, what if he did that to Russ Rose? <laughs> <laughs> I cannot speak personally to Russ Rose's skills. <laughs> maybe they're great, maybe they're not. I don't know. But he did it to me and it was terrifying. <laughs> That's but, funny. You're going to try out physically. Yeah. Do you, yes. I've, I've had a, conversation or a thought i i kind of think it's maybe not mandatory but a monster advantage for juniors at the very least juniors who are first like getting started and need to know what things look like i think there needs to be a young ish coach there Mm -hmm. enough to demo skills Mm -hmm. i don't think you really need 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 that when there's you know you get to the advanced level or certainly like not college like all the demos are fine you're 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 Mm -hmm. done the technique should already be built but do you think that that should be a mandatory thing that you need someone on staff that can actually do it? Or can you work easily around it without needing the visual demonstrator? I think there's benefits and drawbacks to both ways. Um, you know, I've certainly found a lot of success at, at every level at being able to physically demonstrate what needs to be done, mm-hmm. even if it's in a you know more closed scenario. You know, I've gone through three different seasons pregnant and had to, you know, find ways to demonstrate. And I could do it, you know, eight months, nine months pregnant. It was very slow motion. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I, I think you, I guess uh, I would summarize it by saying, I think you can demonstrate even if you're not young, you know, okay. even if you're not in great shape still, um, yeah. or AKA playing shape. So like I said, nine, eight, nine months pregnant, I was still able to like in a close scenario demonstrate. Maybe I wasn't jumping to attack, but I could stand and, you know, show what a cut shot looked like. Yeah. Have you ever seen any coaches that you know they actually didn't have any of the skills? They just knew how it worked. I'm I'm thinking of one person in my head, particularly who's a high school coach, got mm-hmm. n- no shot. He could play volleyball or have any sort of decent arm swing or like I don't mm-hmm. know how he ran his practices, and he had a lot of wacky ideas. But there and there certainly wasn't demoing anything. Mm-hmm. But he had a, a decent program. I think they, they were second in the league. You know, mm. is there a way for somebody who has not played, has not developed a skill? Can they be successful just by studying the game and learning how it should be done and then helping, helping their players? Um, I mean, I think you can. I think it's just a higher barrier to entry. Mm. You know, if you're not able to physically demonstrate it yourself, then you should bet next best thing is having a player or an assistant who could demonstrate it for you. If you don't have a player or an assistant who can demonstrate it for you, then you're going to have to be really good at utilizing things like video or you know, finding pictures of people doing it correctly, okay. you know, utilizing whatever tools you have to try to show how it should be done correctly. Because at the end of the day, if you, not everyone learns the same way, True. you know, as a, as a coach, if I'm trying to get, you know, if I'm trying to teach you how to do, you know, a thumb up cut shot, I'm going to explain it one way and maybe you don't get it that way. And then I'm going to have to use another way to try to get you to do it. And then if you <laughs> don't figure it out that way, another way, you got to have a lot of tools in your tool belt in order to teach a multitude of people, you know, because what works for you isn't going to work for someone else, isn't going to work for someone else. So if you're, if you're not able to demonstrate it yourself, then you're going to have to find someone who can. (laughs) You talked about assistant coach there and that there might be different roles behind people. So assistant coach is a very, can be a very vague role because I know that Mm -hmm. a lot of head coaches have very different skill sets and very different needs. So as somebody who came from a head coach position for Mm -hmm. indoor and is now transitioned to the title of assistant coach, what roles are you specifically in charge of for Grand Canyon University? I am mostly in charge of, I would say the, the scouting is one I've definitely taken a lead on. Kristen knows I love my numbers. I love my stats. (laughs) You know, I love my little Excel sheets. You know, I do a lot of specific apps for that. I don't, I just Excel. Mm. Yeah. What columns do you have? Columns? <laughs> it yeah. depends. Like how, uh, do you, how do you sell? Oh, gosh. We're going to get down a rabbit hole here. Yeah, we give tools to these people. Like, how it, if you're telling me, okay, 
give me five of your most important columns that you use like when you're filling them in what you're tracking what the most important things that you could when it comes to a game who i would say well we can go one of two directions here i would say about once a year i do like a huge statistical study on some aspect of the game okay. and then utilize that as a way to train the team to have success for example two years ago you know my whole theory as far as beach indoors eh, uh, but definitely beach i don't think coaches focus enough on serving you know, I think the, I think they focus probably enough on passing, but not on the serving aspect of it. And to me, those are probably the two most important aspects of the game is your serve and your pass. If you're winning those two points, those two skill sets, you're usually winning the game. Hmm. So I did a really big study on that and had some interesting conclusions. What were they? Um, Will you share them? Yeah, of course. What else am I doing? <laughs> are these your money making black book? Like, <laughs> like no, actually, no, it's not it. my book. No, I'm not going to share with any other coaches. <laughs> well, the really neat aspect of me doing these studies is that Kristen, the head coach at UCU, you know, I present it to her and get her thoughts about it. And then she allows me to utilize that as part of our training. And we've used it as kind of like a driving force. And I thought that we went from a pretty average serving team my first year to I thought we were one of the best serving teams in the country this last season a little biased <laughs> but gotta throw that out that? there how, how do you measure what a good serving team is i would measure a good serving team as that you're getting the other team out of system it's to me serving is a war of attrition it's not about getting aces it's not about point scoring aces and point scoring are a byproduct of consistent tough serving okay. um, what we did with my statistical study is we quantified what is consistent tough serving the consistent part is easy, you know, it's in or it's out. <laughs> like, yeah. Are you consistent? You know, I, I think USA Volleyball indoors, Karch Karai aims for 90%. I'd say 90%. we're probably more of, yeah, 90% toughen in. Do you think the same applies to just like side, side thing? Do you think the same percentages apply for men's and women's? No, I think in the men's game indoors, and I think in the beach game, because the side out percentages are so much higher, I think that you need to go for your serve more. I think you need to be more okay with 80%. So you know, we're, the, interesting, okay. the, the women's beach volleyball in a couple of the Olympics, the mm -hmm. top teams sided mm -hmm. out at a higher clip than the uh, men's teams, than the men's teams. Really? Yeah, it's not across the board and it's not at every level. So not even down to like the 17th and 25th, but the top. And, you know, I kind of looked at that. And I'm like, okay, they're not getting points when they're ripping. You know, mm -hmm. like guys can rip from 10, 11, 12 feet off and still kind of come close to overpowering somebody. Still mm -hmm. a huge advantage for the defender. But just the nature of how much lower the contact of the ball is mm -hmm. to the ground, female mm -hmm. defenders actually have less time to chase down shots. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's playing defense uh, against a quality shot, no matter what, is way tougher on a women's net that cut shot is devastating in the high line because it doesn't need to be uh, traveling as high as a men's one should be more efficient. I think women should be like more efficient shooters, but then it just comes down to that upper body strength and mm -hmm. how, how frequent the peels happen uh, in the women's game. Definitely. And I did my study I did last season uh, was efficiency of attacking. Uh, what is the best shot? In so wait, wait, wait. We got to go back to serving. <laughs> I know. I'm all over the place. What's... I might have uh, peaked too much with my caffeine intake. <laughs> <laughs> You're just so excited to be in a silent room for the first time in five years. <laughs> I know. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so serving. Sorry. Uh, what I did. What's um, an if? What is... And what did you find was an efficient service? So you said consistency. But is there a specific angle to angle a location on the service line that has the most advantage when you serve a spot? What, what did you find there? I started, I watched about five matches at our ones, five at our twos, five threes, fours, and fives. I found that the ones consistently did not matter where the serve came from. The only thing that really mattered was that the passer had to take more than one step to get the ball. If you were able to serve a ball that a passer had to take more than one step to get to, AKA out of serve receive, and then their side out percentage went down like two to 300 points. Whoa. Yep. <laughs> now, I, I, I battle this with players all the time who have the notion of, hey, I need you to serve high deep. So mm -hmm. they make the ball land deep 
but it still crosses the player in their sweet spot. You know, mm -hmm. I, I said, no, you need to learn how to rainbow a serve, how to like mm -hmm. send it high and deep. So can you get a player to take more than two steps to the ball without changing the depth, like the short serve and, and where it crosses them? Or can you get them to take two steps by serving, pinging the ball, but just in the middle or down the line? Is, it, is there enough space there? I think, I don't know that I have a great answer for that, other than I would say when we work on serving, we work on every type of serve. Okay. Um, because you don't know what kind of bad passing angle someone has. You know, for me personally, I have a very distinct bad passing angle. I'm not going to tell you which one, because I'd like to play in a tournament this year. <laughs> <laughs> you better watch out when I come for you in co -ed. <laughs> But every person has a bad passing angle. You just have to figure out what it is. You know, and that's either by watching, you know, maybe elements are a factor. I'm a big proponent for you need to be competent from every zone along yeah. the back line and from every angle. You need to be competent at line to line. You need to be competent at line to middle, you know, angle to angle. Uh, you need to be able to serve a short serve straight down the line, you know, that kind of hard angle short serve. Okay. So um, you wouldn't have somebody master one location and rep out exactly from there, kind of like an indoor where it's like, you serve from one spot and you have your angles or your best serve from there. You like to change their angles in their locations based on where somebody's likely to shank or get aced or have a bad mm -hmm. path. Yeah, okay. we try to utilize conditions and we try to be competent at every serve because just like attacking, you never know when the moment is going to call for you to do a specific thing, you know? And if you're not confident, if the moment calls for a line to line serve and you're not confident in it, now you've lost the opportunity to better your percentages at earning the point. I had a player in Norway when I was a player coach there, head coach mm -hmm. player of a pro team. Doesn't work well. But one of my players, he had uh, an energy problem. He got ex ex exhausted very quickly, mm -hmm. even though he was in shape. It was, a, it was a disease. But he talked to me one time. He said, you know, what do I do about serving? Because I have this, I have that. Yeah, I have a jump float. I have a float. I have a pretty good uh, jump topspin. And when I, the, the conclusion that I gave him, and I kind of still think it would be valid, but you have a limited number of hours you can put in compared to everyone else because you, mm -hmm. you have to cut your exercise at a certain point. Mm -hmm. So I said, develop one weapon mm -hmm. at 100% mm -hmm. and just master that so you don't have to worry about spending the time and changing contacts and, and mastering each location and short, mm -hmm. deep, high, everything like that. And we kind of, we settled on that, but I think if you do have the time mm -hmm. to be able to practice a bunch of serves, it can be good. I wonder if it prevents you from mastering one type of serve, or mm -hmm. are you just mastering the serve strategy by being able to locate at 89, 90% instead of a hundred percent where you're serving? I would say, I like the general thought in, like you said, in general, anytime you can master something, in the game of volleyball, that's really important. You always want to maximize what you're good at. But the flip side of that is if you're maximizing something you're great at, you got to find ways to improve what you're not great at. Yeah. I would say uh, yes, but the benefit of serving is that you can get a ton of reps in. It's one of the few skills in the beach game where you can get a ton of reps in in a very short amount of time. You know, we, uh, again, in my very biased opinion, <laughs> we, hugely improved as a serving team mm -hmm. in one year simply by dedicating five to ten minutes of practice to it okay and that's that's nothing right you know most drills you're five to ten minutes and you get a couple reps in yeah right in the beach game because it's just so physically taxing mm -hmm. but serving in five to ten minutes you're going to serve 20 balls 30 balls 40 balls you can serve a lot of balls in that amount of time True. I just think it's one of those skills from a time management standpoint, you can really maximize. But to your point, anytime you can be great at something, you should work on being great at that. So back to the deep versus short. Okay. Are you training your players like consistently to get out of the system? You want to make move two steps. Is there a mm -hmm. default that you're saying we're going middle to middle because that'll be a big move for both players or we're going sideline to sideline to get them to move? Or are you really focusing on depth of the court the rainbow versus versus the short to get the to get the passer on the move i would say in general we focus on deeper serves um, high deep regardless. or flat flat and deep um, okay. we're looking for fast low neck clearance 
because that's how you can really get your velocity on the serve. Because it's a time function, right? As you mentioned in the women's game, it's a lower net, right? So we have the ability to really zip that serve in versus the men's game, it's a higher net. And I don't know about you personally, but I would much rather pass the ball on a men's net <laughs> than a woman's Hell net. Oh yeah, we have it so easy. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> you said it, not me. But it, you know, if you have the ability to get the ball fast and deep to a zone, I, it's my philosophy that that's the better the better serve to go for. Uh, high and deep, I think there's certainly a time and place for that. You know, you got to run up blocker. You know, you got a lot of wind you're dealing with and you want that ball to sit up there and dance for more. You know, those are times that we've certainly utilized that higher deep serve. But I would say we tend to focus more on flat and hard and then having it land in that last three feet of the court, irregardless of whether that's sideline, middle, or just like straight at their chest. Do you know what uh, the there's? I don't know his name, and I probably should. But the German Olympic coach. But when Germany won the gold medals for men's mm. and the women's, it was same coach uh, who mm. was kind of leading the way in the strategy. And the big part of what he said was, "We don't go for max velocity." He had mm. apparently, and so much so, this is a, a secret among them that their national team blocker Alex Valkenhorst. He wouldn't mm -hmm. give me the answer. He slept in my in my house, <laughs> like right here, and he wouldn't he wouldn't tell me what they what all the German national players know. But he they determined an exact velocity that the Mikasa mm -hmm. ball floats the most at, and so he had them serve at that, which means that they would actually slow the serves down a little bit mm -hmm. when wind was in their face, and when mm -hmm. the wind's behind you, really it doesn't doesn't float at all. He would even go as far as like kind of measuring the air and looking at somebody and going, why are you float serving? And he's like, we've been practicing this all the time. He goes, you can't feel the air. It's moist out here. The ball's oh. not going to float. It's going to be weighted. You need to jump mm -hmm. topspin. And he paid attention to serving that much. And if you watch German teams serve, mm -hmm. you know, they have an emphasis like you. It's mm -hmm. like big emphasis on serving. So do you go, f have you ever thought of that of the exact win versus ball velocity or do you just go as hard as possible where it stays in i would say we've uh, we try to tailor it more to what our girls are capable of you know we have a few girls that have great contact just consistently really just pop that ball perfectly every time and have great float and those kids we default to hey less velocity more float at the end of the day i would personally rather have more float and less velocity as long as we have that lower net clearance sure you know we have a few kids that struggle a little bit with that consistent float so they're ones that we say okay let's go a little bit more towards velocity because we're not getting that dance that movement that unpredictability on the ball so we might as well just try and get it to the zone quicker if you had to pick one serve to live and die by like this is the one serve that I'm going to tell everybody walking into a, a match blind. Yeah. You don't know what team you're coaching, but you're coaching them. You've never seen them play or anything. And you don't know what team you're playing. Mm -hmm. What serve do you serve for the first 14 points? And you have to pick one location from where and to where. Mm -hmm. No wind. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I, I tell everyone on my team this, actually. Personal favorite serve. I always do it first serve of the match. Shouldn't tell anyone that because I'm trying to play this year. It still works. It still works. <laughs> middle to middle, like line to line. I stand in the middle of the court. I line up right in between them. And then I serve it fast, hard with float right down the middle. Because in my opinion, inevitably, no matter who you are, at the beginning of a match, everyone's just a little bit nervous. So if you can just drive it fast up the middle, that's a great time, first ball, to get that easy point. And if I have to do it for 14 points, so be it. That's my serve. <laughs> I like it. Huh. Yeah. Especially when it's equal, there's no game plan, right? You, you don't know exactly who, and that's a good time for it. And I know that a bunch of people actually have gone with that. They like the middle serve and making, mm -hmm. causing a quick question in the beginning. Personally, short sideline for a right side. Yeah. That's I true. I love Especially the middle the to sideline, making them dive forward and outside so that they have to move on two planes. Mm -hmm. You know, they usually got to take a knee. It's a mm -hmm. little bit dangerous if you do it slow because we're so exposed to on two nowadays. <laughs> and it's like you have to have an on two game now. But it's such a troublesome to, to go forward and low and reach. If I'm blind and I know that 99% of, of the world doesn't have the footwork 
mm-hmm. to, to get into that and to get out of it. Mm-hmm. That serves, it's how I can, I'm not going to say sleep at, at local open tournaments, mm-hmm. but if I want to just chill through pool play, I'm mm-hmm. going short right sideline mm-hmm. almost all day, just because by nature of me seeing their footwork after that serve, that's what I'm literally looking for. Serve? Mm-hmm. Or is there footwork? Oh, they don't have footwork. They don't have spacing. All right. Mm-hmm. We're going to put this on repeat because they're not going to get their own hitting distance. Mm-hmm. So that's that's my favorite serve. But I like your middle serve, making that question early on. Yeah. Well, I like doing it from the middle, too. So it's not clear whose middle it is. Like, I stand in the middle of the court, serve directly down the middle to their middle. You know, everyone's like, oh, my middle. But in this scenario, whose is it? No one knows. <laughs> I like that. But I liked your point. I like the short serve. It brings up a funny point because I never short serve. Um, huh. personally john mayer um, would hate you <laughs> no he's, oh, we've lost he's to like john the one, mayer in the last two years oh. oh he he says the one skill that all volleyball players like need to work on or could be more valuable for all of their games he goes short surf no he's right <laughs> <laughs> that was something uh like we didn't do enough of you know and this is my fault we did i'm in charge of serving uh we didn't do enough of this fall and then I was watching our games and we had a few kids with really good short serves and they'd use it at the right time. And as long as they did it at the right time and had a decent level of execution, it was automatic, bad pass, easy ball on our side. And so it made me rethink like, dang it, we're going to have to figure out how to get people to short serve. <laughs> so we, uh, we started adding that to our repertoire probably about February, March. And it's all a lot of success from that too. And it can be tricky, right? Because sometimes you can see a, a good pass and think you didn't do your job. Mm-hmm. But if you don't think one layer deeper of, well, then what happened to the hitter? Did mm-hmm. they get the same approach that they like? Did they get the set that they liked? Even if they got a kill, mm-hmm. was it comfortable? Was it uncomfortable? They rushed off balance. I think people judge a good serve based on good pass or bad pass. Mm-hmm. And there can be another layer of rhythm spacing vision and shot selection do you change your entire swing selection when you get a a serve that doesn't mean you shoot or or swing sometimes it does right Mm -hmm. but can you uh do you become an only hard cross and high line hitter Mm -hmm. when you serve short interesting things to look at i think definitely we certainly do that we consider serve location when we're trying to limit or trap certain shots as well you know, for example, if someone's on the right side and they're a big, you know, thumb up attacker, we're going to consider serving them more middle to try to bring them into the court and cut off that thumb up attack that they like to do. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So, and by thumb up, you mean, so the right, right-handed right side player likes to hit cross court basically. Yes. So you try to drag them into the middle with the mm-hmm. serve Mm-hmm. And then they have a smaller area to to hit into with that cross court. So they're like their favorite yes. shot is they have to be more pinched with it. Mm-hmm. And then it makes defense easier. Then maybe you can pull your block out of there and get their easier back to line shot. And now you have your down defender on their best stuff. And their best stuff is instead of being, you know, this large of a court, now it's that large. Mm-hmm. And that's not perfect, but it's certainly a strategy we consider using when we're back at the service line as well. I like that. Yeah, that's smart. When you know that somebody wants to hit hard cross, mm-hmm. do you run a straight up two on them where you have the blocker obviously take away their best swing? Do you let your defender take it or do you try to bait them into swinging their favorite by running it off of like a four block um, where they dive into the angle? I mean, at the level we're at with the teams that we're you know, trying to beat, you know, the top 10 teams in the country. Uh, Cause I think this last two years, we've kind of been in that like kind of five to 10 range. It's, it's kind of a multifaceted problem. Depends on the hitter. I would say you either generally speaking, if you want to stop someone's best stuff, you're not going to consistently do it with a block. You're going to do it with your defender. Um, you can limit it with a block. You can jump in and get, um, get a few points here and there with that blocker. Uh, but chances are, you know, you talked about the hard cross. Mm-hmm. If someone's really good at hitting the hard cross, they're probably pretty good at shooting it too. So if you put that blocker in on it, then they're probably just going to shoot over you if you don't have your defender there. 
So what we've done in the past, we've doubled up. We've had both players move in and just really given them. You know, I so love maybe that. Them Why don't more players do that? I think so many people are they they believe that the defender and the blocker have to be in opposite sides of the court, right? And then <laughs> it's like it's why some people don't need to see the defender to get to a, a certain level. They can just mm-hmm. see where the blocker is and hit over the blocker without even paying attention to the defender. When if the defender sits middle or you double up two or three times a match, no hitter expects that. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like, no way. They're both going to be on the left side the whole point. So you question yeah. yourself. Oh, for sure. I mean, we've played, I think we played every single team who ended up in the top 10 this year at Division One, and. There were precious few teams and precious few individuals who ever doubled up. Um, and that was a lot of the feedback we gave our players, which is, you know, I think it's the the setter's job to look through the net and see where the defender is. Mm. I think it's the attacker's job to see the block and know that 95% of the time, if they see hands here, there is no one behind those hands. Mm. So it's their job to see the hands and swing hard around or shoot over knowing that with confidence, they should be able to do it. And there's not going to be anyone behind the hands. And I can speak as a player. That's what I look for. I go up to hit. I, it's pretty hard to see that defender and see that movement. You know, things really have to kind of align. I have to have a good pass. I have to have a good set. I have to see, you know, the play in front of me. But at the end of the day, if I see hands, usually not someone behind it. I've been redesigning my thoughts on offensive strategy for Mm -hmm. a couple of years. And the conclusion that I've come to at this point in my coaching and playing career is that I'm not going to react to somebody. I think some players jump, wait to see what's open Mm -hmm. and then swing for the opening, especially lookers. I was a big, like long look for Mm -hmm. a lot of my career. I take, I take a shorter looker. I actually open my peripherals a little bit more now, but I would react. I would wait to see what they're doing and then hit the opposite. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in no way that I have a swing that I'm going for, for that Mm -hmm. point. And then I have an off switch. Like if they do the thing that will stop that swing, then I have my second swing in mind, Mm -hmm. you know, and then, then I'll have a third one. And of course, if something's so easy and so obvious uh, then I'll put that down. Mm -hmm. But how are you teaching your players on offense what what's the the mental sequence that they're going through is it does it come down to a game plan where you say hey this girl sucks at at digging hard driven balls so we're gonna swing at everything or do you say you're great at swinging and we're still working on your shooting or however you want to say it nicely Uh, (laughs) (laughs) so so make sure you hit what mental process do you want your players to go through offensively? I mean, it, that's a tough one. That's, this is a lot of answers. You know, for example, there was one game I was coaching. Um, I was coaching our fours blocker. Her name's Krista. She's wonderful. And uh, she they really, are. high line was so open. Like I, we could have grabbed the ball, stood there and then thrown it over the high line and it would have scored. <laughs> like, so open. And, but she just, for whatever reason, couldn't do it. She just couldn't get that high line. She couldn't get her thumb up, just wrap her hand around the ball, couldn't get the clear. But what she was really good at doing was hitting hard angle and hitting middle back. So at a certain point, because she wasn't scoring on the high line, because she just wasn't able to do it at a high enough level. Oh, okay. So she was missing. So it's not that she wasn't going for it. She was just kind of like flubbing it in her hands or not getting the quite yeah fast enough, quick enough contact. Mm-hmm. Okay. So she was, she was attempting it. She, yes. Yeah. She was very coachable. <laughs> she just, just could not it. execute yeah. it okay. <laughs> for uh, many reasons, could not execute it at that moment. So I finally just told her whatever situation you're in, whatever your best swing is, whether that's hard angle or middle back, just choose whatever ones you whatever, whatever one you're going to execute best in the moment and do that because it's a high enough level swing that they're going to have a very difficult time digging it. Regardless of what the other team's doing? Mm-hmm. Huh. And we, we won the match <laughs> with, with only her swinging, middle back or hard angle. The set was a little inside, she hit hard angle. The set was in front of her, she hit middle back. And we had she had the clearance over the block. The block wasn't um, as big as she was, so she was able to swing middle back even if 
uh, the blocker stayed. And if the blocker pulled, well, she wasn't really hitting at her. <laughs> she, was, she was hitting the middle back or hard angle. And like I said, it was a high enough level swing and she's putting enough pace on it to a good location that we ended up pulling out the match. That's, um, you know, we had uh, Sam Pedlo, the Canadian Olympian, okay. on our podcast when it wasn't a podcast, like four years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. We just interviewed him for a webinar. And he said the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. He said, I know what I'm good at. And I think more players need mm -hmm. to know what they're good at. And when you get into a rut or you're not getting a few kills in a row, the first thing that he checks in with himself is, have I done my best swing in the last three points? Have I gone mm -hmm. for and executed my best swing, regardless of what the other team's doing? And mm -hmm. a lot of the times he said when he was in a rut, the answer was no. He wasn't doing the thing that he was fantastic at. Mm -hmm. And so he would go back to that and he would establish that. And he said that, you know, people think that AVP and FIVB players have all these shots. Usually they're just great at two shots mm -hmm. and all the rest is kind of good, good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas a lot of, I guess, B, A, double A players, they try to have every location, everything. And if you don't do something like we talked about, like mastering one skill, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have something that you've established or repped out, you're going to be mediocre at mm -hmm. all of them. In, instead of like finding a good swing and it's funny that you guys said the exact same thing you know mm -hmm. what are you great at do it yeah. doesn't matter what the other team is is doing like do it oh for sure it's it's a points game right at the end of the day you're trying to get more points before they get enough points um and any time in this sport in which you can be great at something you should do that thing you know the flip side of that is defensively we try to teach our girls okay identify what the other team is great at and from a mental, physical, and point scoring standpoint, you got to try and find a way to limit what they're great at, because that's generally speaking how they're going to try to win the match. Sure. Um, but our girls, it's, I mean, when it comes down to it, you really need three swings in this game in order to be successful. You need a high line, you need a cut shot, and you need a swing down the middle. If you're, you need a high line. In yeah, I maybe, think so. I mean, look, you won that match, but they think that they was. Are. What? Maybe maybe the in the college game, like women aren't peeling as much as I think they are. But I feel like cut shot and hard middle are like for, for women's game from from what I've seen of it and the frequency of peeling, cut shot I think has to be number one for the women's game. I think it's a devastating swing on on the women's net. And that's I, I feel like that's why Brazil runs their defense the way they do. They step into the pocket hard and they just leave mm -hmm. their hands up so that they can take away all hard driven because mm -hmm. you know they're not going to get their glasses taken off too frequently mm -hmm. and then they've cut off basically the cut shot so then the only option now they have is the high line and if you peel on that should should be set so i think the cut shot is 100 percent mandatory is is the high line you want to hear an interesting place? stat second place i would love to so last summer i did a whole offensive theory uh, again, watch just a ton of footage. Um, this is our matches, our level, right? So that's about top 10, division one. Statistically, and I, sorry, and I statted uh, what was the most effective attack between option, high over the block, irregardless of what the block did. Um, and that means they peeled? Sorry, what? What if they peeled? Add a peeler. Oh, okay. So add a backwards or add a down defender. Add a down defender included for stats included the cut shot and the swing. So and basically any shot at a standing down defender into their half of the court. Out of those, what do you think the most effective shot was percentage wise? Are you gonna say high line? Wow. Yep. Um, wow. Part of that I think is just a lot of the teams we play is they're very hard into that angle. And their solution to the high over is usually to run a four. Most teams, on average, uh, some teams will peel. Some teams will have the defender sit a little bit more middle. Uh, but generally speaking, a lot of teams' the solution to the high over is to just move their blocker and put the defender on the high line and hope that they trick you. And if you see that, well then, high angle. <laughs> so the high over the block was the most effective, statistically speaking, attack in the top ten division one. Not every match. I would say I watched, I sat at about 20 matches about that. Wow. 
somewhere in that range. Second, uh, second most effective was the, I can't remember now, it was either the on two or the swing at a puller. And then the, but distinctly the least effective attack was at a down defender. I want to see the separation between hard cross and cut shot. I think hard Um, cross is too easy uh, on the, in the women's game, but cut shot, I feel like if you're nasty with it, I don't know. Well, so I would, I would agree with you. If you choose the cut shot at the right time, the right time, the right ball, AKA, let's say you've established the high line, you've done the high line, you know, two times, three times. Um, and now the defenders leaning that way, get that kind of inside a little bit tighter set where that cut shot drops fast, then you, then it's a yes for me. But what we were doing before I did the kind of hitting stats is we were cut shotting just to cut shot, cut shotting oh. just because it looked cool. I don't, I don't know. I shouldn't say that. I love, I love my girls. They're wonderful. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, it's too arky, you know, mm-hmm. that's where the player is already facing. They're already facing forward. Mm-hmm. So if you put any arc on it, like mm-hmm. cloth right now, sure, it's always easy to point at the like world's best current players. Mm-hmm. But when you see Taryn go up and hit a quote unquote cut shot, <laughs> she hits it the way a cut shot is meant to be hit. There mm-hmm. is zero arc. No like little spinny stuff. Gets mm-hmm. high, slaps it down. Is every human capable of doing that? No. But if more people could stop take putting arc onto their cut shot and imagining that a cut shot goes kind of up and then falls down over the net. Mm-hmm. If you can reach high and get it to go sharp down off of your hand, it's the best version of a cut shot. And if you can't do it at that moment, then you can't hit that cut shot. Oh, for sure. And I will clarify that to say that because it's a time function, like you yeah. said, it's a how fast can you get the ball to the sand? Historically at GCU, we haven't had the tallest players. So, you know, we're dealing with a geometry problem. <laughs> we're not up terrible. as high as a Terran cloth is, right? So if we're not doing the cut shot at the right time, you know, maybe a little bit more of an inside set, a little bit tighter to the net, we're not getting the ball to the sand fast enough to beat the defender. Sure. You know, teams actually scored on the cut shot a lot against us. We didn't score a lot against them. Okay. Um, so that's certainly, because I watched all matches of us, maybe that influenced are my stats generally yeah, speaking not true yeah sometimes also, you'll t- you'll set one teams and you get a statistical set but it might not be a look at the entire country of like if, mm-hmm. if you took stats on just gcu and you took t- stats in the entire country or the entire world what shot is the most effective maybe for a different team because of the way you mm-hmm. practice or whatever it's not a perfect experiment but Definitely. it's important to look at it and at least it gives you guidelines to make a guess Mm-hmm. move on it and then decide if you're right or wrong yeah you know instead so of just could, we'll do whatever yeah oh for sure and i uh, i would say so 50 percent of the stats that i took are gcu stats and 50 percent are our opponents but our percentages did hold true for them as well who knows you know <laughs> what am i but a lowly accountant <laughs> just uh, applying my skill sets to the living time. your life in excel sheets <laughs> I, I think it's so funny that you don't have uh, an app that, that does it for you. I know a few coaches are using Huddle. Data Bali, I think, is trying to be better with indoor. Like, I know Jordan Chang used Data Bali, but he finagled it so that it became beach. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they've... I hope they do, they have they have good, efficient stat-keeping things. Anyway, do you have... I have one question. Mm-hmm. Blocker peel percentage. Okay. What percentage of the time do you think women in the college game peeling right now and i know that it's it is situation by situation but still there are lots of in-system sets that i see that are flawless and Mm -hmm. they're peeling and i think they should i think way more athletes everybody from who is under open Mm -hmm. should be peeling way more Mm -hmm. but what percentage do you think players peel uh in terms of swings versus defense i mean i think anytime you have a not in-system pass you should be looking to peel so i would I'm putting an addendum on that anytime you make him pass bad, <laughs> get, get on out unless it's over. That's something we focus a lot on. Uh, Kristen, Kristen Rohr is a great puller herself. Uh, she was fantastic at it. And we spend a lot, a lot of time with our blockers working on how to get off the net and still do something great up here. Because um, two down defense is a lot better than one down <laughs> defense. I completely agree. Completely agree. And I, I still see five five you know 50 year old women who are 
throwing their, I'm not even going to call them hands, throwing their fingers up there above <laughs> the net. It's like yeah. they're not really taking up much space here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time as like, no, you're not a blocker, but you are a net protector. So you hover around that 10 foot line, you make sure there's no oversets and uh, you don't mm -hmm. want to lose points on the other team's mistake, but get out of there. Definitely. We say uh, our kind of rule of thumb is blockers. If you believe you're going to block the ball, then stay up and block the ball. If you don't believe you're going to block the ball, there's no point in you being up there. You know, if that means you're just pulling to the cut, that's fine. At least you've taken something away. But if you're, you're just jumping just to jump, you're not serving your defense much. <laughs> much yeah. <laughs> well you know it's a pretty rare scenario where you stay up for no reason other than to just be in the hitter's head you know maybe you maybe if the blocker blocks the hitter a few times you know maybe if you're actually like in that attacker's head yeah. then it's like okay yeah we're gonna keep staying and you're just kind of gonna jump around and we're gonna use our defender to scoop up any easy shots because we know they're not gonna swing it but it's a pretty rare scenario where that happens do you think the set, the passes and the sets should be lower with the frequency of peels in the women's game to like, to be able to hit at a blocker before they even come close to getting set? Would there be an advantage or a strategy there? I'm just thinking, you know, like, how am I going to beat a peeler? Well, if I can get on the ball quicker and get them, get the ball on them before they're even stopped and I have the advantage. So maybe if someone's peeling on me a lot, I'd like to run a quick set or two. Yeah, we have a play set for that. Again, going back to my point before about how uh, we haven't been the biggest team historically, mm -hmm. uh, you got to find ways to neutralize larger blocks. So we, we like to run what's called a be quick in those scenarios, which is a normal set, but just lower and space off the net. Because uh, what we want to bait that blocker into is a bad stay or a bad pull because they have less time to decide. And because that set is now off the net, that gives you, again, it's a, it gives you a geometry advantage. If the set's off the net and the blocker stays, now you have more room to go over them. Mm -hmm. If the set's off the net and the blocker pulls, well, it doesn't matter because the set's shorter, so they have less time to get back. Sure. So then you have and more you time. Accelerate it to the deep. Yeah. Or even do a high line still. You, we talk about presets a lot. Okay, we're going to run a B quick and we're going to preset that we're going to hit this ball high line. Because we know in most scenarios, based on what the other team has historically done against us, that's going to be a high percentage shot. We're going to score, or at worst, they're going to be in a bad transition scenario, and we're going to get a free ball back. I like that. That goes, it, well, I like it because it matches uh, what I'm currently doing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> where it's like, okay, we're going into this point, and we're hitting a certain shot. You know, mm -hmm. so you design the set and the, the pass and the set so that you can hit that shot and so that you want to hit that shot. It's not mm -hmm. we're going to hit that shot and then you don't change anything else. It's a little bit layer deeper. Like, I know that I have an effective shot. I know the situation that they're going to want to put us in. So how do I create the best version of this? And sometimes it's a lower, sometimes it's a higher set. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's inside, sometimes it's outside. But people can design their offense mm -hmm. so that... Yeah, uh, you can hit a certain shot more effectively. Definitely. And we try to do, you know, going back to what we were saying about everyone's got a bad passing angle, you know, everyone's defense breaks down at a certain point on a certain set. So we try to be really good at, you know, two to three swings in a multitude of zones okay. as attackers. Because um, again, it's, we're not the biggest, most physical team. We're getting bigger. We're getting more physical. We got some really nice athletes, but we're still missing a few inches compared to some other teams. You know, USC can get out there and say, okay, we're going to hit hard and harder angle, and then we're going to throw in some high lines and then maybe have one or two, you know, shots on top of that. But they can, they can do that philosophy and be really successful with it because they have some really large, competent players. <laughs> You know, they just had a, had a lot of talent on that squad. You know, we didn't have as big of players, and that's fine. The beach game can certainly neutralize that. But, you know, our whole philosophy is that, okay, if we, it will be very difficult for us to be successful with that philosophy. So what can we be successful at? Well, we can be successful at running from multitude of zones along the net and figure out what the other team isn't great at defending. And then within each zone, we try to be really good at two to three shots. So that way we go into a match, we say, okay, this program or this team really struggles when the ball's in this zone. Okay, we're looking to run out of this zone. 
And we don't need to have a bunch of shots in that zone, to your point. We just need to have two, maybe three. Mm. Certain swings work more consistently from certain locations. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and maybe that sounds obvious. Well, like, yeah, if you're off, you're not going to hit, you know, hard cross because it's it's mm -hmm. too easy. But still, even when you're in the middle versus outside, mm -hmm. like there are certain things that you just shouldn't continue to do. You know, the, mm -hmm. the further off you are, probably you're going to have to add more arc to that cut shot. And when people mm -hmm. are off and then they try to hit a cut shot, yeah, that's going to work against somebody who's super slow. Mm -hmm. But once you get anybody with strength and athleticism, they're gonna pick that up. Definitely. You know, uh, we, we. I always get like the the players who are beginners who get beat on short balls. Like, well, if I peel, they always beat me short. And my answer, I kind of sound like a jerk, uh, but it's you have to be stronger and faster. Yeah. You know, and there is a limit to the number of plays you can make if mm -hmm. your physicality isn't there, and and vice mm -hmm. versa, your capability of making plays increases with your speed and strength because you can take more powerful steps quicker mm -hmm. you know, so if you're struggling to get a shot it's not always like a strategy thing it's your strategy you should be go to the damn gym <laughs> <laughs> you know i've told a player to that and uh to their credit they've done it <laughs> so yeah I, but you know interestingly enough i think uh i think the beach game it's it's so easy to score in because you're in the sand <laughs> um, people, people just rolled their eyes at you thousands the thousands of people listening just rolled their eyes at you <laughs> sorry so i'm sorry <laughs> but it i mean it is if you think about it from a math from a geometry perspective if you have the ability to put the ball where you want on the mm. court there's a lot of open sand you know there's probably six one two six different zones you can put the ball in it's four corners middle front and middle back where if you put it in any of those zones, it's very difficult to dig successfully, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you have the control to do it and you can hit those six zones, well, there's only two people. They can't cover, you know, at best they're covering two to four of the zones. Yeah, yeah. So if you can put it, figure out what's going on, on the other side and have the control to put the ball in a spot, that way, I guess that's what I mean by it's really easy to score in the game. Yeah. It obviously takes competence. Sorry, everyone watching. <laughs> Don't mean to sound judgy. If you have the competence, the skill set, physicality to do it, then that's why the side out percentages are so high in the beach game. Mm. You know, even at the highest levels. You know, I if you're, you're hitting more of that middle back, you yes. know, for like hard driven, especially. Mm -hmm. I wasn't introduced to the high hard seam. Mm -hmm. Maybe until I was like 31 when I moved out here and I finally started training with the USA team, you mm. know, that was when it was like, well, yeah, just, you know, hit a, hit a skinnier cross. Don't hit right at them. Yeah. Oh, cause I knew about sharp cross. I had that from the right side, you know, just chop yeah, yeah. It down outside them. But then you see Jake Gibb, you watch him long enough mm -hmm. and it's just, he aims for high middle mm -hmm. so consistently. And then there is space in between the blocker and the defender where you can, abuse that but I, I think people think about cross that you know they do a vanilla generic cross mm. where it just goes straight through the chest of the defender and it's like well they're gonna dig at least at minimum five of those yeah for sure I, uh, i've had a few uh life chats with some of our players i think our not i think i know <laughs> our one's <laughs> defender uh Naya evans she uh she really loved to try and swing straight through the down defender and I said, look, Anaya, you're, you weigh like a, a buck 30, <laughs> like, you know, you're, you're pretty ripped, you're pretty strong, but it just, it, it's really difficult to blow through someone who's standing in the corner. Yeah. You actually you know? can't knock somebody down with a volleyball. <laughs> yes. There are very few people who can hit a ball hard enough where it goes off their chest yeah. and goes up there. And so then when she started, you know, hitting away from that down defender, she saw her side out percentages improve hugely. Um, that was the same, same for me. It was like a quick, quick increase in hitting percentage. Mm -hmm. As soon as I learned how to snap a quick ball in the middle, even when there was a blocker up, you know, that's, that's, oh, yeah. Well, because you think about it from a geometry perspective, how do you dig that ball? I think who else? Katie Spieler actually has a great, high deep middle back ball played against her once good job by her she won and scored, <laughs> scored in that spot <laughs> but it's just it's because it's high and behind you 
the only way you dig that ball is if you stand closer to it. If you stand closer to it, well, now you're giving up a sharp angle. Yeah. Some anything in the other direction. So you know, it goes back to my point that if you have the ability to stay in system and can put the ball in a multitude of zones, and it's you know, it's easy to side out from that per, from that perspective. And so yeah, she's five five, jumps pretty well, side up, sides out pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's always so funny. You're just like, well, I'm too short X. I'm too short X. You just need a different skill set. Yeah, you just have to be excellent. At, you know, uh, Alex Kleiman and try to model her game. Don't look at Tara Cloth and, and try to try to model her game. Like, hey, you're short, so what are you going to be good at? You know, and, and just exploit the hell out of the things that you can be good at. Um, and find an offense, like you said. Like, if you're shorter and so you can't bang, get somebody to peel on you. Mm -hmm. but do it so that they don't have time and then know the shot that you're going for when they do it. And then you can still beat that peeling block. Uh, when Ryan Darty, 7-1 Ryan Darty, uh, when he was up there, he used to try to get Ryan to peel by having the set set at 10 feet off so that Ryan would be tempted to peel. And he knew that like his block was, was more of a threat than his actual uh, hands defense. Mm -hmm. So he would get him to peel and then snap quick at his head just by having an offset. And he found, you know, that's a, that's an 11 inch deficit that he had, but he found a system and a mm -hmm. way to, to overcome that. Definitely. I think anytime you can figure out what your opponents are not good at and exploit it, you're probably winning the game, right? Mm -hmm. I have practice in 14 minutes. So <laughs> I've got two last questions for you. Okay. Number one, is there anything that you've learned or learned back in the day as a player that you do not coach or you don't think should be coached anymore? Something that was a flip for you from beginning to end, beginning to now. Oh, that's a tough one. It shouldn't be coached anymore? Yeah. What What did you learn that you're like, that doesn't actually work in the real world? <laughs> Probably being emotionally really high, I would oh. say. I think when I was younger, hmm. and I don't know, maybe I didn't I probably didn't have coaches who said this. This was probably just like an aberism where I was like, oh, I know the most. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. Because I was <laughs> unfortunately one of those players. Sorry to everyone who has ever coached me. Um, <laughs> I think I just, I just, I thought I was playing my best when I was emotionally very high. And reality is, is I was playing my best when I was emotionally within average, but I was tactically at 100%. When I was sitting back there and counting what was going on, counting how many times I'd done this, how many times I'd done that, how many times they had done this, how many times they had done that, that's when I was playing at my best. So I really try to teach my players that, you know, emotional management is at least a third of the game, you know, if not more. You know, I spend on, on my walk and talks and my timeouts and my in-between sets. Even the players that are really good at managing emotions, I would say I spend about a third of my time with them. Just do you think that some people, an average. do you think that there are people that perform well when they are hyped, you know, and that there are people that perform well when they're in that middle ground? Cause I've, I've gone to both ends of the spectrum. I used to be mm -hmm. all hype. We like, I guess mm -hmm. like most college kids, you know, you come out there, you're on the sand, you're like flexing and showing off for the fans and everything. Mm -hmm. And I would let my emotion show. A lot of times I was completely under control under the surface. So a lot of people like thought I was a hothead, but I would explain yeah. to my partners, like, I'm going to go yell at this ref. It's going to mm -hmm. seem like I'm upset. I'm fine. Just give me five yeah. minutes, you know? <laughs> yeah. And like underneath, I was thinking about the next point, mm -hmm. but then also like when I was hyped, I was hyped. And now that I've done some meditation and, and stuff like that, I just need confidence Mm -hmm. and and calmness so the ability to have an increased heart rate but not a blasting heart rate and yeah then being able to lower it when i feel it getting too hard so it's like an above average heart rate that i like to sustain mm -hmm. now and then but there's that time where somebody has to take the big risk mm -hmm. first you mm -hmm. know and it's one of those back and forth matches it's who's going to step up right now and do something harder so there's got to be some kind of balance there but do you think that everybody should be the calm stoic or no. do some people operate at a high level when they are crazy hyped and not even mm -hmm. able to think? I think a lot of people can perform at a very high level when they're hyped. Uh, I guess I would clarify to say that you need to revert to your mean. You know, you, what you don't want to have happen is have this super high, high emotionally, because usually that's followed 
usually, because again, I'm a numbers person. I talk about percentages. That's usually followed by a low, low. Mm. And you don't want your graph to be this up down trajectory. Where you want it to you be sustain? okay. We're high and then we're back within our mean. But to answer, you know, to my point, your first example you used was that while you were acting emotionally high, you were emotionally confident and calm inside. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with being having those really high highs as long as they're not followed by low lows. So whatever can be sustainable for mm -hmm. a long time and that you can that zone that you can always play in. Mm -hmm. I've I've had a couple partners that played well hyped really well. Mm -hmm. But when they were not hyped, they were trash. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, yeah. and it's okay. Now, how do we find a balance here? Because you can't show up hyped every practice and every day, because then you're just mm -hmm. going to take different swings than you do when you're low energy on mm -hmm. match point. So you have to find and really work on where is my zone. That's so hard to discover. Oh, I agree. You know, and to your, to your point, that was a big wow. I call them words of wisdom. Wow. You're so clever. <laughs> <laughs> God. The girls, every girl on my GCU team who's watching me right now is just like, oh, Coach Abra. <laughs> <laughs> but one of my big wows after going to nationals is that while we were tactically and technically prepared to compete with the best teams in the country, I don't know that we were emotionally or uh, what's a better word, mentally uh, as prepared as we could have been. I think as a coaching staff, we could have done a better job of preparing them. So our big thoughts going into the fall, which I haven't, we haven't told the girls yet. So surprise, anyone who's listening, um, is that uh, every Friday we compete. And normally they're like, you know, they're competitions, but it's more like, hey, let's just work on what we've been practicing all week. This year, we're going to say, no, Fridays matter. We're going to treat Fridays as real competitions. We're going to treat Fridays as if you're playing against USC as if you're playing against UCLA as if we're in nationals and you're seeing that giant 20 foot scoreboard watching the little points tick down <laughs> and seeing whether your team is winning or losing. Mm. Cause the only way to really replicate that is to do your best to replicate it. Um, the only way to practice it is to do that. You know, I talked to my husband who's been to two Olympics about this for a long time. Cause I can't imagine anything scarier than sitting in this tiny little boat at the start line of the Olympics going, oh my God, oh my God, just don't mess <laughs> up. <laughs> you know, and he's been there. He's, yeah. uh, he's been to two Olympics. He's been to numerous world championships. He knows what that pressure feels like. Mm. So he gave me a lot of really good advice on how to handle pressure and how to you know determine what your play mentality play personality should be like and at the end of the day the conclusion was is you just have to do your best to replicate it in practice kind of a long-winded answer but no but that's is. a great answer and like how is there a method to discover it to find because i feel myself to be quasi chameleon-esque like mm -hmm. i can adapt i feel like i can adapt to most situations Mm -hmm. and be whatever I need to be in that conversation. I'm not really that guy that's like unquestionably me and this is how I do everything. I kind of see mm -hmm. a situation and I, I figure out how to get into there. So for somebody who can play hyped, who can play confident, who can play silent, mm -hmm. how would one discover what their best playing mood, mentality, et cetera, is? Like what, how do you discover your best competitive character? I think by experience, by putting yourself in those types of situations and match scenarios that matter and figuring out where you play best in. You know, if you're doing it without being in practice, then you, you know, look back. You know, when I look back, at, I, I can look back at all my matches over the last 20 years and, you know, determine which matches I played best in. And it's the ones where I didn't have that roller coaster where I had some high highs. I popped up emotionally when I needed to, but I always reverted to my mean and that internal calculator that I have that I feel like gives me an edge in matches. So that's based on history. If you're newer to the game, well, you're not gonna discover it until you play enough matches to figure out when you're playing your best. And then pay, pay attention to it instead. I think, so we have, for anybody who's listening, better at beach.com forward slash partner profile. And I'd love, Abra, if you, if you check this out and if you think that there's some questions that belong there. But I was trying to discover this on my own journey of figuring out, like, how do I 
meet up with partners emotionally better? How do I know myself as a player? And a lot of it came from honestly marriage counseling before we got married. We we're like, no, I for sure wanted to go to a therapist, marriage counselor. I go somebody who is a lifetime coach and invests in lots of coaching. Hell yeah. I want coaching in marriage. Like, Make me be the Smart best man. damn husband there is, you know. And there was a lot that that I learned, and uh, hopefully I'm 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 a great husband. You know, it's up to her. But I I kept translating everything to volleyball, and I was like, oh, I've never done that as a partner. Oh, I've I've, I've never done that. So we've got this performance kind of journal, kind of questionnaire. So if any of you are interested in learning about yourself as a player, it's called betteratbeach.com forward slash partner profile, and it's got a few questions. One of them like the it, it says, what are your trigger words? Like, what do you never want to hear ever out of your partner? How yeah. do you want your energy when you're starting a match? And then after the matches, you know, it, it'll make you write down, hey, what was your energy level? Describe mm -hmm. with one adjective your mood and then describe what you rated your performance level at. And mm -hmm. I think that, that, that writing it down instead of looking back, because we always kind of associate memories in a hazy way, it's a good start. But I think writing it down and saying, what was your energy today? Mm -hmm. What was your mood? And what was your you know, self-assessed performance level? And then you can really start to hone in on it. No, I think that's great. I think that's a great tool. I'll definitely check it out, see if that's something we can utilize with our players. Because for me personally, I've, I'm have i gifted in that I have a memory like a steel trap, for better and for worse. <laughs> you know, I forget nothing. <laughs> Forgive easily, forget nothing. <laughs> um, so it's uh, it's easy for me to go back and you know remember things. But yeah. I think it would be a lot better to be able to contemporaneously sit down and you know, right after a match, write down you know, how I felt. And I don't really want to ask my partners <laughs> what they felt. It's so uncomfortable. It's, so it's uncomfortable. A terrible yeah. things. Uh, yeah, but I, like check it out. Betterbeach.com forward slash partner profile. Yeah. It's free. It's not, it's not anything. It's something that I'm working on that I think oh. is going to be very important for a lot of players, coaches, people. But it's very That's much right. in its, its rough draft. So uh, if you want check it out, give it to your players. I ran through it with University of Utah. I, I ran it with their players, just a live mm -hmm. scenario. And I had them write some things down and their coaches really enjoyed it. So I want to see what you think about it. And anybody at home listening, betterbeach.com forward slash partner profile, check it out and see, see if you like it. And if you can answer some questions about yourself and your partner. Yeah, that'd be great for sure. Well, Abra, I have to sprint now. Okay. So <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> thank you, dude. Thank you so much. For your time this was awesome it was good catching up with you again for sure um, same here yeah and good luck next year and and this summer and uh on the recruiting trail and and, and in your excel sheets <laughs> yeah i gotta figure out what stats i want to do this summer i'm not i haven't quite decided i think i might want to circle back and uh redo my serving and redo my attacking mm. uh, just to see if uh, the team really has moved forward like i in my very biased opinion, think they have. <laughs> I'd also like to see hitting percentages from locations on the net. Like okay. if, if you divide the, the net into five zones, outside, mm -hmm. push, middle, push, outside. Mm -hmm. I want to I really, really know where the majority of humans are most efficient, efficient from and mm -hmm. maybe where certain unique players are as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I've be always cool. been interested in that. Like, are people always hitting from the long, wrong location? You know? Ah, I'll do it. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, one of our big wows this year was running what we called a middle middle set. Staying on your side of the court, but kicking in and mm -hmm. running out of the middle. Um, I saw Kara Bolger, uh, the German uh, Carla. Uh, women's Carla. Yep. yep. She's my spirit animal. I really need to learn She's how so to cool. her name. She's such a cool human. Oh, uh, but yeah. she wrecked house at the Olympics by running that middle middle set and either booping back over the line, ripping it into that shorter hard angle, mm -hmm. or waiting for them to pull and just lighten them up. Um, so that was a set that we added to our repertoire this year, and we found was really successful against a lot of programs. Mm -hmm. So it's so it's so tough on the defense to know what to do in the middle. Yeah. How much line do I take up? Should we like stay where we are? Are we supposed to switch now? Yeah, that's. Mm -hmm. I think it's confusing if you can have a good offensive plan to hit out of the middle. Definitely. So, All right. Here's my thirty seconds. That'll be for the. That'll be for I the next. Out of practice. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, Abbott. Hey, thank you so much. Um, good luck, guys. If you are interested in uh, catching up with Abbott, her uh, profile, her Instagram profile, if you want to see a bunch of pictures of her family <laughs> and some volleyball, uh, is on our show notes, as well as links to her coaching bio and uh, Grand Canyon University Beach Volleyball page. Follow along, support them, and uh, see what she's doing. Yep. Go up. Where's the man? Dang it. Go Lopes. <laughs> <laughs> that was hideous. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> You're good. Go Lopes. I'm with you. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right, Ever. Have a great one. You too. Bye. Bye.